What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogan, aka the Seattle Data Guy. Today, we're going to focus on practicing for those SQL interview rounds because whether you're a data analyst, data scientist, or data engineer, SQL is your bread and butter. It's the Lincoln Park to your Naruto AMB. Uh, rest in peace, Chester. But in all seriousness, it is a classic way of working with data. So that's why it's important to be ready to do some form of SQL round, whether again, you're a data scientist or a data engineer. Recently, I got to try out Interview Queries platform for practicing for data science uh, interviews because I've been helping someone practice for their data science interview. With that, I got the opportunity to go through several SQL questions. And so I wanted to one, go through some of those SQL questions, but two, try to provide tips along the way. So I really wanted to go more in depth than just being like, hey, here's how to solve the problem. I really want to go into how I'd recommend you study and also think about some of these problems. So let's get started with an easy one. So for the first problem we're gonna look at, we're looking at empty neighborhoods. Basically, this problem is asking us to write a query that returns neighborhoods that have zero users in them. So basically, we have a user table and a neighborhood table. Basically, you can connect both of these via the neighborhood ID, and that will let us know which neighborhoods don't have users in them. So that's kind of already pretty obvious, right? We're going to need to connect these two tables, and then we're going to need to just output basically the name of the neighborhoods that don't uh, have users. Now, I think this is interesting because when we got to this question, we both actually had slightly different answers. My initial answer was pretty straightforward. So I'm going to just use distinct, but I'm going to again go through a different way um, and then end dot neighborhoods or actually just end dot name from neighborhoods, which we'll say is N and we'll, we're going to left join this to the user table with you. And then we're going to say on basically again, the N ID equals uh, u.neighborhood ID. And I'm going to stop there because that, again, we kind of explained this, that we're going to join these two tables um, because here's where the difference kind of happens. Personally, for me, once I see this, I know that I can just essentially say, hey, where user is null or the user ID is null, that is where we're going to have essentially neighborhoods with no users in them, right? It's not as clear. So for example, when I say where u.id is null, for some people that might not be very clear that this is stating, you know, no users. And maybe in this case it's easy, but for example, let's say, you know, there was more joins here. I don't know uh, what they'd be joining to, but if there are more joins here, you're kind of forcing someone to figure out what this UID stands for. So if we had it set up like this, essentially, it might be a little more difficult to figure out where this u.id came from, especially since it's named ID and not user ID, which is what I'd recommend if it was in a data warehouse, but since that's not the case, um, you know, it's just gonna be UID. So it's kind of a little more, it's not necessarily implicit, but it's a little less straightforward in how I'm doing this zero users. Um, but if I run this query, just test it out and then submit solution, you'll kind of see I've passed um, this solution. So this was one way you could answer this problem. But the truth is, I think a great way for you to practice your SQL knowledge is to try to answer a problem in multiple ways. What this forces you to do is kind of go beyond that instinctual response. Because I'll be honest, when I saw this question, this was my instinctual response. Like the immediate, oh, I know exactly how to answer this. Um, and I didn't really think about why it worked. I just knew that it would work. So if you really want to kind of practice this problem and understand it, I'd say try answering this problem in a different way. So here's a great example. So instead of doing this whole distinct and all of this, this where is null, we could do a group by uh, n dot name. And instead of you know having that previous where, we can set up a having basically count uh, u dot id equals zero. So what this does is this is a little more explicit. Basically, it's going to count because count will only count if it's not null every user id that exists. And since we have a left join it will not count anything for those neighborhoods where no users exist. Essentially doing the exact same logic. It's just maybe a little more readable to someone who's not familiar as much with like a left join. Now in theory, you should be familiar with it, but this is just a different way you can answer the problem. So if I submit the solution, you'll see the test is passed again. So both of these are valid solutions for this problem. And I'd argue this is a little more readable for someone who's maybe newer to SQL. And I'd say the other way is probably what someone who has a little more SQL experience will likely write. But that is the solution to problem one for writing a query that will return all neighborhoods that have zero users. Now let's go to a slightly more difficult problem that's going to require another tip I recommend, which is 
taking the time to do steps when there's a lot of logic or data that needs to be cleaned up before actually answering the question. And there's actually a Facebook question like this that you will get asked unless they change it. But this is a great way to practice it in terms of like understanding that you need to sometimes pre-process data prior to actually implementing logic. So in this problem it's saying, given a table of song plays and a table of users, write a query to extract the earliest date each user played their third unique song. So the fact that it calls out the fact that there are unique songs, that's an assumption and you should probably also create the table, but that you will likely have an example where you'll have song ID something like this. If each of these numbers represents a song ID, you might not get to the third unique song till several plays later. Meaning if you wanted to use something like a row number function, you would likely end up with something like one, two, three, or even if you happen to partition it by song as well. So if you were partitioning this by user and song, you know, you get one, two, three, and then start again here, maybe one, two, three. And this would kind of ruin your whole ability to tell which one of these is the third unique song. So in order to kind of get rid of that, you want to, what I'm going to call, deduplicate the data. So, so to speak, really, you're just trying to get the earliest date of each song play because that's what matters here. So basically your first step here is to write a CTE, which is basically to do just that, which is to get user song ID and the earliest date of play for said song. So if we do this, we have the song playlist. So we can just say select, oops, song ID, user ID, and then get the min created at. And then we'll just call this created at for now because that's what they want at the end of this. So if we look at the end, this outputs what they're expecting. So I wanna make sure we give that and then we just need song ID and username. So at the very end, we'll have to join this for username. And honestly, that's just an extra add-on um, to join it to username. Other than that, really the hardest part is going to be this part. So we wanna get that from song playlist and then just group by song ID and user ID. So this will basically get you the minimum date for each song. Oops, I forgot an as. From there, you can go into the next step, which will be essentially ranking those song IDs based off the created at date for which value is the third play. So with that, we're just gonna say T2 as, and we're gonna select basically from T1 on, and we're gonna join to users now, so we can just get username. Oops, join on t1.userid equals u.user, oh, it's just id. Thank you for constantly tricking me there. And we want u.username t1.songid. You will want the created at value. And then most importantly, this is where we're gonna just basically do a quick row number. And this is going to give us the value for the third song. So in the future, you could use this to use essentially any N, in this case, it's the third song, but maybe in the future, they'll want the fourth song. And row number over partition by username and order by created at. And I think they want it the third most recent song, so this should be good. I don't think we need to do two. So this should be good. I don't think we need to do descending. And then let's add a little alias, so row number from all this. And from here, we just need to do select. Again, this top side. Oh, create that's gonna be unique. So T1 dot there from T2, where row number equals three. I'm gonna see if there's a problem. Of course there is. Oh, code ran successfully. And there we go, we have submitted the correct solution. So as you can see, this is broken down into three different steps, or at least two key steps, and then kind of just the roundup step. This first one's not necessarily a deduplication step, but it kind of acts that way where you're just trying to get the earliest date of a play. So you're trying to remove all of the erroneous kind of plays that aren't going to answer the problem and just make it messy and just clean it up to the granularity of first song play. So that's what we've done here. We just created a list of first song plays. After that, we put the row number on it, which lets you know the order. And then it's just about pulling the data from there and just saying, hey, row number equals three. And that's really it. And sometimes that's what you need to do. Sometimes the first step that you need to take on is cleaning up the data because otherwise what you're gonna end up doing is likely taking this and 
maybe putting this down here somewhere where you you actually have a sub query and it just it just gets messy and harder to kind of understand and work with right like you might join this in here and i think just having these cleaner data sets as you're going forward in in general honestly especially when you're working with um, logic makes it easier to test as well as just understand the different kind of steps in logic so that's generally what i like to do when i'm doing um, interviews if i can kind of break down some of that logic early on i'll set it up earlier and then go forward but let's just review again we'll look at this problem one more time so the first table is just a first playlist second table basically counts and ranks the second ct basically just as a row number based off of the play date and the third one is just the output expected data because we can't um use row number and aware clause. So hopefully that was helpful here. Now let's wrap this up with the final problem, which is the closest SAT scores. Now, I think this problem is deceptively hard and easy at the same time, because depending on how you read this depends on how you're going to approach this problem. Basically, it's asking, given a table of students and SAT scores, um, write a query to return the two students with the closest test scores, with in terms of score difference. And if there are multiple students with the same minimum score difference, select the student name combination that is higher in the alphabet. So basically we only have one table here and we're going to need to do some sort of self join here in order to compare the two students. And it might be tempting to do something where you add in row number to you know compare students, but we can actually do something simpler. Instead of doing anything with an analytic function, we can do something with a self join. So let's say select star from now, or actually let's do t1.student as one student, and then comma t2.student as other student. And then we're gonna say from basically scores. And here's where it gets a little bit tricky is we need to do a join here We need to do a join here that essentially combines all possible combinations of students. Now, maybe some of you are kind of familiar with this concept of cross join or something that's similar. Um, one way you can do this is simply just saying one equals one. Now this is kind of sloppy because what this is going to do here is say, if you have student 91, join that to student 91. If this is student 92 or in, you know one and two, join that. And then also join one and two or two and one in this combination as well. And so you're going to end up with duplicates doing this as well as comparing two people that are the same, which could be messy. And there are ways you can avoid this by saying, you know, where student ID doesn't equal student ID, but there's something a little bit niftier here, which we can say instead t1 dot ID is basically less than t2 dot ID. Now, let me explain why this works. Here in this point, basically we're saying, okay, if we have ID one, well, ID one is less than two, so join two. And if we have ID two, or let's say we have ID one again, and we have another ID three, well, again, it's less, so we join it. But now we're at ID two, and so you wanna join two. Well, what's it gonna join to? Is it gonna join to one? Well, two is not less than one, so you're not gonna join there. But two is less than three, so you will join there. Finally, you'll end up at three, and since three is bigger than two and one, you won't join there. So this just kind of limits the data that you're working with and just cleans up everything so you don't have to add in extra logic. Now, the only other thing we need to do here is essentially add in the difference. So we're just gonna say abs and say score t1.score minus t2.score and then they want score diff. And we're almost there. If you recall, the only other thing we need to do is make sure one, we only return one value and two, return the lowest score and make sure we return the highest combination of student names based on alphabetical order. So in this case, we can do order by for this three, one, two, which will basically just say, give me the lowest score here, three, one. So this is score. And then one and two are the names. And then we can just say limit one. Let me test this. Nope. Names. Oh, why is that? Let me remove these comments. Okay, so that should be the output. So if I say submit solution, ooh. and of course I didn't realize I used a greater than and not less than sign. That was my fat fingering. So if we run this query and submit solution, then we will find that we get the right answer. Now, the only other thing that I would point out is that in some way you might actually want every combination, basically something like this. 
only because when you say it does not equal, um, this will ensure what I just did basically won't happen because basically what this works in terms of going greater than that fails because there's one combination that should have been referenced first, which only exists on the less than side. So I think after having that error, I would say that does not equal would make more sense um, just to make sure you get every combination. Part of me really wanted to make sure that the answer was super clean. Um, but in this case, I think does not equal gives you a better output. And part of me wanted to have kind of less data so it would be more clean, especially if you're like working with a big data set. Uh, but overall, I think that this answer would be more correct. So happy to be wrong on this one. If anyone in the comments thinks that this should be done differently, please let me know. That was just my personal opinion on this last problem. And if you wanna try out interview query for yourself, I've got a link for it below. Uh, it's a great place to kind of just practice a lot of these problems. Again, I've had the opportunity to practice with someone with a lot of these problems in the last few weeks. I think it's been a great way of looking at more than just SQL, um, especially if you're a data scientist. I think they've got a lot more in here than just SQL. They also have a lot of coding, A-B testing, statistics, um, product style questions that are pretty broad. So I thought this was a pretty good experience in terms of practicing SQL. Um, and again, there's a lot more here than just that. Hopefully this was helpful for you guys if you're out there practicing SQL and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.